Probate Weekly, and this is our Thursday afternoon, 4 p.m. Pacific, 7 p.m. Eastern time. We get together every week at Probate Weekly to talk about all things probate real estate, whether you're an investor or a wholesaler um, or real estate agent, attorney, vendor. If you're interested in, in probate real estate, this is the place to be. Uh, normally on Thursdays, I interview top producing agents, attorneys, vendors to help us be more productive and successful in our um, real estate business, whether you're an agent or investor, seller, so we can make more income and more money. Um, no charge, I'm not selling anything here, really, I'm just a practitioner. Uh, I need this, I need colleagues, I need to learn, I need to grow my business to be successful. A couple things to give you an opportunity to participate in. Um, let's see, we've got a little background noise. Oh, there's John, very nice, we'll add you into the spotlight. Great John, with a great, John always has the best backgrounds. Um, but a couple of quick housekeeping things. Um, free Facebook group um, called Probate Experts, if you want to join. I post a lot of free material in there on a regular basis. Love to have you participate there if you'd like to. If you go into Facebook and it's Probate Experts, or there's a link there you can click on and get in there in free as well. And if you're here locally in Los Angeles, um, we have a live real estate investment group that meets once a month. That happens to be the second Thursday of the month tonight at 6 o'clock locally in Culver City. I put the uh, link in the chat box. It's the L-A-R-E-I-C event. Get 250 people in the room, which is great, uh, and also about 50 vendors. And, and there's a speaker who will speak on improving your credit so you can be fundable uh, if you want to try to raise money for buying properties, fixing properties, flipping them, those kinds of things. So there's a housekeeping. I'm really excited tonight, or today, depending on where you are, to invite in a, a, a colleague and a friend, I think, and um, somebody who I've learned from uh, as an attorney, um, but I think most importantly, an active participant in our probate community, uh, John Fraker. John, welcome to our call today. Hey, Bill, thank hey, you so much. Can you hear me all right? I can hear you fine. Uh, okay. Let's see here. I just got I my Yeti room. mic. I hear you perfectly. Good, thanks. So a little background on you, I know, among other things, you're both a realtor and an attorney. Most right. importantly, you went to law school at the University of Southern California's Law School. Fight on. Fight on. <laughs> uh, so give us a little background. Where did you grow up and then how did you get into uh, real estate? Awesome. Thank you, Bill, for having me. Very, uh, very honored to be here to your, present to your group. Um, I grew up in the Bay Area, so I grew up in a little town called Saratoga, which is a suburb of San Jose. Uh, so I've watched our area here grow from orchards and apricots and uh, basically an agricultural background in Santa Clara County to now kind of the capital of Silicon Valley. So uh, to say things have changed a lot in the last 40, 50 years, would be a huge understatement. Um, I went to high school at Bellarmine College Prep, Jesuit High School in San Jose. Uh, and then I went to, did my undergrad at Berkeley. I double majored in history and political science on my way to law school. And then, as you mentioned, I did my law school at USC, got my Juris Doctor. I lived five years in Los Angeles, three years for law school, two years after that. And then moved home to the Bay Area, set up my own law firm in 2002. We actually just had our 20th anniversary of setting up our law firm. July Congratulations. 1st. That's two decades. On them. And then... Um, Oh yeah, and then I wasn't done with school, so I took a fourth year of law school. It's called a LLM, a Master's in Tax Law for Taxation. Oh, uh, wow, perfect. Yeah, it's kind of weird because it's a Master's of a Doctorate and that doesn't make logical sense, but when does it ever make sense in law? <laughs> <laughs> well, for me, because we had a question yesterday or two days ago in a group that I need, uh, I, I call my accountant number, but maybe I can get you an answer on this call here for us since you, I might have hesitated being only attorney and not an accountant, but since you have somewhat both, I'll, the question out and see if you can answer that so great and so you what percentage of your work in, or business now is real estate and what percentage is um attorney work uh it's actually about two-thirds one-third i would say i mean a lot of my real estate is just serving my clients and their real estate needs for my law firm and um, you know i'll get i'll give some specific examples later but you know when we talk about one of the bigger issues both on the estate planning side and on the real estate side Capital gains is one of the most enormous issues for people in the Bay Area. Yeah. And also, also in you know, Los Angeles where you live, yes. a lot of the rest of the country doesn't really have to have to worry about it too much. Because uh, they hit the exemption and that's that's right. plenty for them. Yeah, exactly. So you get, you know, 
in general revenue code 121 gives husband and wife, a married couple, $500,000 free capital gains before they start taxing. And that will cover almost the entire nation, except for a couple of um, places like the Bay Area, Northern California and LA and Orange County. Um, but right. I have a ton of clients who were who shot past that back in the 80s. So um, that's every bit as much a factor in our real estate market as any other dynamic. So let's jump right into a question that came up on the Tuesday call. I don't, know if, if, I don't think you were on. I also host, as you may know, Chad Corbett sometimes. I, I fill in there. Uh, his probate master call on Tuesdays at noon. And a question came up that I kind of know the answer to, but I was hesitant to answer. Of course, I'm not going to give legal advice. I'm not an attorney or accounting advice. I'm not an LLM. Uh, and I probably called my accountant to get the answer, but I'm glad to have you share it with us. So one of the questions that came up with is, there, so there's two different um, uh, exclusions. One you mentioned was um, uh, a, an individual has a one-time $25,000 exemption, couple uh, $500,000. And then in probe or at death, there's a step up that happens that when somebody passes on property, that property, uh, when they inherit it, is at the new current appraised value, not at the price of bought it. So commonly in the Bay Area or in LA, People bought a house 40 years ago for $50,000 as a modest home. Maybe they added on to it, but when yep. they passed this year, the house is worth $3 million. And you might have a $2.5 million or $2.9 million, theoretically, tax liability. Yep. The exemption covers two fifty dollars or five hundred, dollars but the step up would give them the exemption because they're carrying current basis. Can you explain that a little bit, how that works? Yeah, absolutely. And honestly, that's one of the things I've been lecturing realtors and title companies on. Um, so, so lecture us. Go, yeah, exactly. lecture us. <laughs> two different things going on at the same time, right? So the section 121 exemption is your primary residence exemption. And that means as long as you qualify having lived in it as your primary residence for two of the last five years and have been on the deed for that time, um, then you qualify for 250,000 per spouse, 500,000, right? There's another uh, part of the tax code dealing with step up and basis, right? Um, and just what you talked about. So husband and wife, if they own it as community property in California and one spouse dies, it eliminates all of your capital gains. So I'm gonna tell you one extremely important thing that I've run into in my career. If you own it instead of husband and wife as community property, you own it as husband and wife as joint tenancy, you only get a partial stepped up basis, not all of it. It eliminates roughly half the capital gains. And can leave them still with a six-figure tax bill, depending on where they're at and how much gain is built in. Just by how the deed is titled, potentially that's a six-figure mistake on their deed. And I see that all the time. Um, it's like the number one thing I check for when uh, a married couple comes to me for a trust. And then they want to put their house in a trust. The first thing I do is pull up their old deed. And if it says joint tenancy, then we got to do something about that and put that in a community property. So, okay, so husband and wife, and of course, if one passes, the other one, if it's community property, uh, or if it's true as community property, the surviving spouse gets it at the stepped up basis. They don't pay right. the profits on the half that they got from their spouse, uh, and then they're still alive, so they could sell it, um, but they, they um, uh, uh, if, okay. So the case in probate is uh, mom and dad pass and give it to, let's say, a son, and uh, the son inherits a property, but I believe the entire amount, they, they inherit the property at the new stepped up basis. Let's use an example, $3 million, right? Right. So generally, if it's now to the next generation, all the people who set it up have died, then in general, you get the stepped up basis. Now, one thing, well, I'm, gonna, one thing I'm gonna tell people, this is something that's very not well known, even in our tax and estate community, the stepped up basis was set up as an offset to the estate tax. Right. So people don't remember this. This is very inside baseball for the tax in the state community. But way back in 2010, the state tax disappeared for almost an entire year. And that was uh, that was the way Congress had passed the George W. Bush tax cuts that they sunsetted at 10 years. So in 2010, the state tax actually repealed for one whole year. Um, and then literally Congress had to sit there and get their act together and come up with a, a new rule on that and figure out how they're going to go. But during that time, that time frame, if somebody died during that time frame, potentially they were not subject to a state tax. The difference is they also lost the stepped up basis. So oh, wow. 
when the wow. when the government and the IRS got together, got their act together that year, they gave people the choice. They said you can either do stepped up basis or you can have no estate tax. And the famous the famous story that you know the the famous case is that George Steinbrenner, owner of the New York Yankees, died in 2010 when there was no estate tax. Oh wow! Three billion dollar plus just for the Yankees uh, and the news organization, the radio and the programming that go with the Yankees. So. Um, yeah, they very much chose no estate tax because they could deal with the capital gains issues and things like that on their own. Right. I'll, I'll, I'll give you a different, I mean, that was a very rare kind of period in history. But, but that caused them to have to sell, the, to pay the, the capital gains tax, which was better. They still had to pay, they had to sell the, the Yankees because capital if gains they, on $3 billion is still $600 million. Yeah, but you get, with, a, with an operating business, you can do a whole bunch of other tax planning that, that the, the average person isn't going to do that, right? Steinbrenners. Right. A corporation like that can recapitalize, do a whole bunch of stuff on tax. So they and they weren't really, but I'll give you an example. My team, my NFL team is the Steelers. And when you know Dan Rooney, the owner, died, the estate tax can force the team to be sold from the family if they can't raise the capital to pay off um, 40, 50 percent of the net worth of the of the enterprise. Most people don't have to deal with the estate tax now. Currently, the the exemption is you know, combined 22 plus million dollars. So most people are dealing with it. But to your earlier question on the capital gains issue, we had this happen with one of our families. I did a trust for a family. They bought their house in Sunnyvale in 19, I think it was 1958 when Dwight Eisenhower was president uh, for $25,000 in Sunnyvale. That was a lot then. That was a big house then. That was a lot of money then. <laughs> 25,000 whole dollars for a house in Sunnyvale on nearly an acre of land in Silicon Valley, <laughs> orchards then, right? And they were a very middle-class family. I mean, upper middle-class, right. but they weren't, right. they were not your tech titans. They were not dot-commers or billionaires or millionaires even. They were house rich, cash poor, or cash upper middle-class. And so what happened is they did a trust. They put their house in a trust as community property. And then uh, a couple of years later, they refinanced their house with their mortgage team. And the, to refinance it, they took it out of the trust. Classic case. Yeah. Classic, classic. And I and, think they're- and the, bane that... of my, and the bane of my existence. So what happened when they took it out, they put it in a joint tenancy. They remember to put it back into trust, which they don't always remember to do. But the last recorded deed said joint tenancy, even though they had already done it community property. So wow. in 2015, the dad died and the kids came to me and they're like, mom's in a nursing home. I don't know that she'll ever be able to return home. If we sold it tomorrow, what would the tax hit be? And we ran the numbers and it was a six figure tax bill if, if the IRS treated it as joint tenancy, because that's what the last deed said. So instead of selling it, they you know got some loans on it and paid for mom's health care that way. And then waited for mom to die, eliminated the capital gains. And then our Keller Williams team, we sold that one in 2021 for $3 million. So from $25,000 to 3 million. <laughs> Which the kids got at the step up. Yeah. The, the, the kids got stepped up, so they had really no, no, uh, no tax on the gains on the property. Exactly. So and, and so one of the questions that came up that somebody brought up, and I and I knew it was wrong, but again I I can't say with authority, but I I guess if for sure you can, is their families say, well, we don't want to transfer the property in probate. Uh, we want to uh, have the we want we want the probate to give us the property or you know, transfer through probate. Uh, because we get stepped up and then we'll sell it. But really that's two transfers because you're transferring it from the state to the party and they start, then they're going to sell it again versus just selling it in probate. Yep. And I believe the right answer is that whether or not they sell it as part of the probate estate administration or get the property afterwards, they're getting it at the stepped up basis either way. Is that true? Yeah, the stepped up basis has nothing to do with probate trust or any of that. That's just how... That's the means and the vehicle by which it gets to the next generation. Got it. Stepped up basis comes on the person who dies, right? And, and, and I was obviously embarrassed when I asked the question on Tuesday, and I said, you know, I don't know the answer for sure. I don't have it. You know, normally I have a, you know, some documents I would send to a customer if they asked me the question. And I said, I'm going to call my accountant right away and get that. And I, you know, set up an interview with him to a video. I'm going to get some documents to hand out. I'm glad to have you on that call. And if anybody is here from the Tuesday call, that's the question that we were stumped on. And uh, it's glad to have somebody here who's authoritative on that. So it sounds like you get in the weeds then on estate planning, avoiding probate uh, more than you do probate. 
Yeah, I mean, the the really interesting thing is how little probate there is in the Bay Area compared to its population, right? It's right. one of the larger population centers in America. But um, for instance, when I did all the leads, remember, and, the, and you bought my and I bought my leads from um, per county or whatnot, Santa Clara County was like anywhere from 40 to 65 leads a month on probate. Right. Right. And then Alameda County was more, it was about 70, 70 to 80 range, sometimes more. And then uh, San Mateo, for instance, which is, I mean, it's not, it doesn't have any big cities, but it's where a lot of affluent people live. They only had about 30 to 35 per month Wow. Um, for a major county in the Bay Area. And that's because almost everybody has living trust wow. and has yeah. for the last, you know, 20, 30 years. So probate, I mean, probate is here, but it's not like, you know, in Chad's larger group, you know, nationwide. I mean, I, I asked all the leads I was looking into markets outside California to, to run the program. And, you know, Allegheny County at 400 a month, which is Pittsburgh, right. <laughs> and there's, there's a County to combine with a city of almost 2 million. So comparable size to Santa Clara County, 400 a month versus 40. So uh, um, that's a lot. Yeah. It, and, I think and Cincinnati, Hamilton County, Ohio, just giant numbers. It was staggering how much more there is in other parts of the country. Well, in other parts of the country, the probate penalty is not as great. In Pennsylvania, I mean, it's still there's a penalty of sorts, but it's not as great for a lot of various reasons. Yep. L.A. County, um, we have 500 probates a month. I think it's the largest probate court in America. Atlanta, uh, Fulton County, I think is second. They trade off around the same number, so it, it definitely yep. skews lower income, and also we're going to have more procedures and more diff, you know difficulties as far as that goes. Right. So, so you. So you are really, I think the way you describe your, I would describe your business is you're really an attorney who happens to also have a broker's license and uses right. his skill. Uh, maybe you, you're a realtor only to join the MLS and the tools because you know how to do real estate. You don't need the realtor sales license as much as maybe just the associations and the tools yeah. and the those kinds of things. Well, to be, to be here's a fun story. Um, I'm actually not a broker. I'm a, I'm a licensed uh, salesperson. Right. And here's the funny, the reason it's funny is way back in 2004, during the real estate boom between the dot-com boom and the crash of 08. Um, I applied to do my broker's license because back then all you had to have was be, you know, a JD and you automatically skip any qualifications to sit for the test and take it. But I was so busy with law. I never, I didn't, I literally didn't have the time to sit down and study. Right. So I skipped the test and then didn't think about it again for another 10 years. And then I reapplied in 2015 and they added the experience requirement. <laughs> to right. be a broker i'm like if i had done it back then i've been a broker without any extra hassle just pay the money right the test. and now you have to prove it's your full-time job x number of hours per year to qualify to sit for the broker's license which now right. almost every state has that but there's no there's no experience requirement to be a broker right uh, prior to the crash it's kind of funny that way well yeah i mean i, I but on one hand you could you know you're an exception of paths but there are a lot of attorneys who would get a broker's license but do so little real estate to some degree it kind of yeah you know it's kind of like attorneys who, what i see it and, and, um, and i'd love to get your feedback on this in in los angeles county 90 percent of the probates are done by attorneys who've done one probate or less in the last 12 months right and while they might be great constitutional scholars and brilliant people and great communicators and writers if you only do one probate every year or less, how good could you be at it, right? Right. And the same would be true with a with an attorney being a real estate salesperson or broker. If Absolutely. you're primarily if you're full time attorney and you're part time doing real estate, how good can you be? And and that kind of you know causes maybe some problems for you. Absolutely. And, yeah. Yeah. And so exactly, and that's a great point because when I got my license and I was looking around for a broker to join, that was my number one criteria is. Who can I partner with to assist me with the things that I'm not a professional at, right? Right. Yeah, you know, staging open houses, all that stuff. So originally I was with a company called Intero, a brokerage, yeah. which is local to the Bay Area. And I think they have some presence in LA, maybe. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. And they got, I think they're merged in with Berkshire Hathaway. I'm not sure of the whole story. Definitely, yes. I know for sure they are. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, I was with them uh, around the time that was happening. And then after about a year and a half, I, I switched over to Keller Williams. And, um, yeah, so our, our office, Keller Williams Bay Area Estates, is Las Gatas, Saratoga. We cover uh, most of Silicon Valley. We have a we have a satellite office, um, Pacific Estates down by Carmel, which is 
<laughs> obviously, if you can get business in Carmel, you're you're loving life because that's some of the most beautiful and ex- and also expensive homes to sell in America. It's so beautiful down there. Um, Seventeen mile drive. It's yeah. It's amazing. Here. Yeah, that, that that's just an amazing area. Wow, very nice. Okay, let me let me see. So this is design. I could chat with you all day long, and I enjoy really enjoy you being on the call on a personal level. Uh, but it is meant to be interactive. I advertise as interactive, so let me say, I know we've got a pile of questions I want to kind of jump to a little bit. Sure. Uh, Josephine, uh, let's see, is she here in the, in the, she's in the call, bring her in, let me just check real quick. She's one of our regulars, and I really appreciate her support, there she is. Josephine, your, your camera's off, so I assume you're not available. She says, when administrator is appointed with limited, as opposed to full authority, is there something in their background, lack of funds, the reason for the title? So before you answer that, let me just kind of explain. So in California, there in, in many states, there's uh, when the court gives the approval for somebody to handle an estate of somebody who passed, there's generally two types. There's full authority, which is really not f- complete, but it's a lot, versus limited, which is you're allowed to do certain things. And it varies in, in, in particular, and in most commonly, full authority, you don't need court approval on the sale of a property, though there's a process you have to follow. Limited. By definition means you sell the property, but then you bring it to court to prove the terms and there can be an overbid process. That's the most commonly known difference in the two. So why is it, she's asking, would somebody only get limited authority versus full authority? I know the judge has some discretion, but I think there's also some basic criteria they use to make those decisions, right? Yeah. So the general criteria is that the will has to waive and basically choose into independent authority, right? Okay. So the number one reason you're going to see it uh, with limited authority is there's no will. So if someone dies in test state, then there's no will that waives it. You can still request it. And if nobody objects, they may allow it if you get a bond. But the people also have to qualify for a bond. And the number one reason I've seen people go limited authority is they didn't have the financial criteria to qualify for the bond. I have a, yeah. I have a probate right now that was in test state, right? So no will to waive it um, and to, you know, to opt out of uh, limited authority. So we had to qualify this person for my client for the bond. And it was about uh, ballpark $2.4 million estate. That's a substantial hefty bond. And it's not just how much you make, your credit worthiness, et cetera. So um, kind of like a mortgage, you had to get a couple of co-signers to get that one over the finish line. That one absolutely had to be independent authority because uh, there was a reverse mortgage on it that was already in its like fourth month. And we needed the independent authority to close that sucker out you know, yesterday. I have my own, uh, what's the word, prejudices against limited authority and the overbid process, because the whole, the whole point of the overbid process is to make sure that somebody doesn't sell it for less money than you could get, right, in an auction environment. But for the last 10 years, especially in Northern California, that's almost mathematically impossible, right? There's zero reason to sell it for less than the maximum unless you're doing a family transaction, and that can be blocked on its own criteria. But if you're throwing something on the market in Santa Clara County, or the Bay Area, San Francisco, you're going to get top dollar. You don't need an extra court supervised process to get top dollar. There's an auction frenzy going out, right? So the house that I told you about that we sold in 21 for 3 million, we listed that at 2.29, right? And the system was coming at 2.5. And we had 20 offers inside of five days. And um, about five of them were over 2.9. And, and so we obviously the top one also is the best qualified, the most money down, waiving contingencies, et cetera. But it wasn't, I didn't need a court to get maximum dollar on it. We got maximum dollar the old fashioned way, right. on the MLS and see what happens. And it was a little bit of inside, um, you know, what helped us out is that in 21, if you remember this, for more than a year, um, Carr and the Association of Realtors didn't allow open houses the old fashioned way, right? The big cattle call. Right. Um, due to coronavirus. So our weekend that we hit MLS couldn't have timed it better. We put it on MLS the first weekend that they opened up to the old school in a year and a half. Wow. Um, and that's we had a hundred people show up in one weekend um, to, to go through that house. And I mean, it was, it was a great house. And the, I mean, obviously you're paying for the neighborhood. Um, it had some issues only to the tune of one family lives in the house for 60 years. We right. have some deferred maintenance, et cetera. Right. And it didn't photograph as well as it could have, but that's all irrelevant in this market. Right. So the over a bit process is to make sure that there's no sleight of hand kind of deals. Selling right. it to your buddy for less than, than fair market value. 
but that's in, that's the, the vast majority thing. of it it's irrelevant in california i could see that being relevant in markets where you know days on market are greater than five <laughs> right? right um you know santa clara county routinely has less than a month of inventory at any given moment so you know, well, there's buyer's market seller's market and then there's seller's market where the needle is snapped off the other direction well i think I, I mean i generally agree with you i think the the i, I would say there's a three to five percent of the cases of limited authority where somebody's trying to pull something over on somebody they right. they keep the information back they won't tell you that they still have it vacant they won't tell you right. some solution to a problem and they'll only tell their associate a real estate agent double end the deal and that, and frankly i made a living the last few years looking at those deals and overbidding those deals and making good money with those deals put together so if you can find that one of a hundred or two of a hundred um uh, particularly in la that's what i've been working on so um uh i don't have pronounced name patricia um asked a question and again i think this is the most the number one biggest misconception in in probate is people think that if they have a will they avoid probate and the truth is the will is just a question either you have or not but you're going to probate yep. if you if you um whether you have a will or not it was not going to avoid probate correct and can you exactly yeah probate is the latin word that means effectively to prove the will right so in the olden days it was to prove a that this is a valid will and b that the person's actually dead right and um i mean that's ultimately the probate process is I mean, it's more complicated than that, but at the essence, you're proving a will. That's what probate means. Um, so the primary difference between like probate and intestacy is you're either going through a probate with a guide, a roadmap from the will, or you're going blind um, with intestacy, and that's the default of the probate code. So there's a whole section in every state, the intestate code, that says what happens and who gets the money if there's no will. But you, so when, I, when I give when I give my living trust seminars. The first thing I say is it's actually a misnomer to say that you don't have an estate plan. You do. Everybody in California has one. You either have the one that the state of California has written for you in the intestate code, or you have one that you've created that reflects what's important to you. And then I let them compare the two and show them how bad the default is. And is that something you want, right? The big one, especially for parents of children under 18, you know, if, if both parents are gone, you need a guardian for the minor kid. Are you going to let the judge do that for you? Are you going to let the judge choose who the guardian is? Or should the parents do that? And, you know, I realize it's a tough decision. It was for me and my, <laughs> my wife you know, thinking about guardianship <laughs> issues. But do I want a judge making that call for my family and my kids? Absolutely not. They don't know me. I tell people that um, the state's plan looks a lot like the Department of Motor Vehicles. It's just not that customer service oriented. Yeah, exactly. I'd prefer <laughs> to deal with the DMV. I, I would. So, so if you've not been to probate, you need to, th and if you think it's not a big deal for your family to go through probate, yeah. you need to go to probate. That's what I tell people. And I said that all the time pre-COVID. I said, if you, if you, if you're having a, an issue over this, whether you need it or not, come hang out with me. Let's go down to the probate court and see what people are there for. Exactly. Um, Nancy asks, I know she's on the call. What if the title is held in a revocable trust? Right. So funding it to a living trust is the premier way to avoid probate. Right. right. So, so a, a living trust is also a revocable trust. Like the definition is the same, correct? Yeah. Living trust is a marketing label. You know, a, you know, the tax language is it's a grantor trust, it means the people set it up, it's their property. Right. And so I always stress on the tax side, you know, husband and wife create a living trust, put their money, put their property into it. Your taxes don't change. You don't need to reflect it on a 1040. You don't need an EIN or anything. It's a revocable, disregarded entity according to the tax code, right? So federal, state, local, every level of government disregards the fact that you have a trust. Nothing changes. That's the that's the legal language of a grantor trust. Is that there's no legal or tax difference between your house and your trust and your house out of the trust from the from the tax perspective. Primary benefit is if you're in a coma or you have dementia and you're not able to handle your financial affairs your successor trustee can manage your affairs without going to a conservatorship while you're alive. And after you've died, your money can be distributed to your beneficiaries and heirs without having to go and you skip the, keep the court system out of your family altogether. Can I just go back and say, if God forbid you're incapacitated and the court has to set up a conservatorship for you, that's like probate, but it's like 
two million early. times. It's like it's like two million times worse. So yeah. it's more expensive, more bureaucratic, more challenging. There's no. It's a, it's, a, it's a train wreck. Yeah, I tell people. Yeah, the only thing worse than probate is the conservatorship. Yeah. So I, I had a client who came to me to do the probate after her dad died. For the last couple of years of her life, her dad was in a um, conservatorship, and it's a mess. I've had a couple of things, a couple of those cases, and it's the amount of, of garbage you have to deal with the paperwork, the accounting, um, you know, have to get court permission to pay almost anything. Um, to close out a conservatorship, you have to file. If you're not good at record keeping, you're going to you're going to detest conservatorships because you have to file the original receipts from the nursing home. Right. Otherwise, you will not be allowed to close out a conservatorship. That's a California um, quirk that you have to file the original receipts as sent to you, mailed to you from the nursing home. So if, you're, if your parents are in a nursing home for three years, you have to file with the court three years of original records, not a copy, original records of the bill that they sent you and that you paid them. So, And that's just one little tiny piece. Um, but you're right. A conservatorship is the only thing worse than probate. It's a living probate, but somehow worse. They finally found a way of making it worse. Sometimes the court approves the conservator, and and then the court has to approve an extra ten hours, and and then the conservator turns in their ten hours plus their expenses, and they're and, and the judge is reading into the record three thousand two hundred twelve dollars and sixteen cents. No, it was sixty one cents. Okay, yeah. sixty one. And so somebody's typing this up. Yeah. It's just amazing the work that goes into. I mean, I guess at one level watching every detail, taking responsibility is a serious matter because right. somebody along the way didn't. And I had a client who had multiple properties in multiple states uh, yep. with no advanced planning, which some went through probate. Then he, he was uh, uh, incapacitated, opened a conservatorship. Then he passed probate. Some properties were left out. We had to uh, add them back in later. So it was just nonstop. And if he had a plan, it all would have been done by his daughter or son or whoever right. uh, easily. And so it's just. Um, yeah. One, oh, one thing people don't know is that if you're in a conservatorship and you don't have a trust, the attorney and the conservator can put together a um, self substituted judgment. It's basically creating a living trust and then presenting that to the court and saying, if the person was here mentally and. Uh, in their right mind, this is what they would do for themselves. This is what right. the trust would look like. Right. The court will literally make that trust active and you put the property into it during the conservatorship. If you have enough time to do that, that's basically job one for any conservatorship attorney is to create a living trust so they don't have to do that. There's no reason to have a conservatorship and then go to probate afterwards. That's just a failure by the law firm that set it up. And, and the only reason to do it is unless... Two parties are fighting, and they can't, they can't get the judge to decide. It's yeah, just, it was just, it, it, it's judges just. Are nuts. Well, yeah, but also families go nuts. Put and that on the record, so I don't get disbarred. I feel like I'm going to disagree with you. Okay, so um, uh, SK asks, how does a step up basis work for rental properties? So I guess the question is, is there any distinction between personal residence or rental property as far as when somebody inherits a property, do they get it stepped up basis either way? Yeah, step up, step up and basis is on all the property that is seed. So there's literally no difference between even security stocks and bonds get stepped up. So if you have capital gains and stocks and bonds, the entire state gets a step up. That's it's in the same way that your state tax covers everything that you own. Same with the stepped up and step up and basis. That's all covered real estate, income property, residential. Um, and in most of the country, again, they don't need that for residential property because they have less than half a million capital gains. Right. Um, but obviously in the Bay Area and Los Angeles and much of California now, that's not the case. So, yeah, the step boom basis applies to all assets of the, of the decedent. But, Next but question. Do to, but do you have to uh, have it at community property? I couldn't hear the question. Bill, can He's you asking if the property if is community property. So if you have a probate, it, it doesn't, if you're an heir, it doesn't matter if it was held by um, somebody, uh, if, if the deceased mother, father, you're only getting the probate when they've passed. So it doesn't really matter how the title was. Uh, SK, if you're talking about um, a spouse, that's going to vary. The step-up basis, as John right. said, applies for the community property, does not apply for uh, joint tenancy. Ten you get half, you get half you, of it, basically. You wipe out half your tax. Right. Um, and again, so, in most of the nation, that's going to be more than adequate, right? Or it's going to get you down to a number that's not that bad. 
Um, but I, I routinely have clients with one to three million of capital gains on their residence. I had a lady who bought a, a house, an executive kind of condo thingy uh, in my hometown. Uh, they, my hometown is just single family residences, right? There's almost no apartments. There's almost no even condos. There's like five condo complexes in the city. Um, and they had, this was basically city zoning and planning from like the 60s. They had a plot of land that had been a winery. Um, for those who remember Paul Masson, the commercials with Orson Welles. Yeah, the yeah. winery was downtown Saratoga or on, you know, not downtown, but it was on Saratoga Avenue. And that winery there went out of business. That plot of land, the city allowed them to sell it to developers. And they put in 84 executive homes in 19, I think it was 95, 96, about the time they put that in. So I had a client, she came from that area. She bought her house, she and her husband bought their house in 96 for $800,000 for a five and two, 2,400 square foot house in Saratoga for $800,000. 10 years later, her husband died and they had a million of gain in that 10 years, the first 10 years. And then she came to me 10 years after he died to do their estate planning and other stuff uh, and tax planning. And she gained another million. So she had $2 million of gain in 20 years. Wow. From eight hundred, from basically 600,000 to about 2.7, 2.8, depending on it. So just an insane amount of capital gains in, in certain areas. One of the things I see happening more and more, it used to only be in Beverly Hills, where there was a tax, I want to call maybe a mistake or, or neglect to, to deal with it ahead of time. And now somebody has a property with a huge tax bill if they sell it. They don't really want to live there. It's not really their lifestyle to live in such a uh, expensive house. Sure. And so more and more, they're turning to renting them, leasing them, and airbnb them, uh, turning it into a rental property, and then they can take that intact, and 1031 exchange that down the road. Do you see that happening? Is that part of your, gee, we have a mistake here, but we can fix it. It's going to take two or three years to get that done. Is that part of the process? Yeah, I mean, Airbnb is something that's highly popular. It all de- it really depends on your market. It's also probably the most regulated industry currently. Yeah. And it like look nationally, any yeah. area of the nation where hotels dominate the city, Airbnbs are are under the boot. Yeah. Uh, it's actually I looked up, I've actually looked up the laws in like probably three dozen cities. Myrtle Beach, it's actually a misdemeanor, and they may actually throw you in jail for running an airport. Wow. Because Myrtle wow. Beach is a tourist run right. in South Carolina, right? In the right. hotel industry. So right. if you just Airbnb your house in Myrtle Beach without, um, I mean, just basically it's not allowed. Um, right. San Francisco's tried to do that. They try to crack down on it. It's, it's harder. Um, but the, one of the number one things I'll tell you in the last five, actually, the last 15 years, one of the bigger developments, Prop 19. And that's eliminating the parent-child Prop 13 step up or transfer, right? So for for property tax, but that's enormous, especially in our area, your area, Correct. and especially where I'm at, because I just described to you people bu- buying houses for under a hundred grand in Silicon Valley. Right? right, I had a client who bought a house in Menlo Park, overlooking a golf course on Sand Hill Road, where everyone's like, I didn't even know there were houses there. I'm like, yeah, you go down this one street. And you can walk to all the venture capital firms and they bought it for 50 grand when John Kennedy was president, JFK. And, <laughs> the people I mean, buy that just to make it a breakfast nook for their business. I mean, I have, a, yeah, I have a lady who bought her house in downtown Palo Alto for 250, wow. 250,000. Wow. wow. And so the, the biggest change in our industry in the last 20 years for property tax, right? It was always getting better for people, Prop 13. Um, basically said, if you bought your house prior to the law being passed, 78 give or take, um, your property tax would be benchmarked or pegged to the 1975 value, and then they could increase 1% a year, and that would be your cap. And so throughout the Bay Area, and I know it's the same where you are, you had one house paying $2,000 a year on property tax, and their neighbor paying 3000 a month on property tax. Yeah, that's a that's a big issue that gets bigger every year, and yep. nobody really understands what's going on with that. Right. So Prop Fifty Eight was the parent-child exempt transfer, which basically meant when anybody died, they could leave their their house to their kids, all their houses to their kids, and they would take their parents' property tax basis. Right. So I have a client. He is he lives in a very affluent area of San Jose, uh, with his wife and daughter, and they love their house. His mom died. This is about ten years ago. 
his mom had a house in Saratoga, which is not, I mean, I don't want to sniff at it, but it's not, it's not like the $5 million part of Saratoga. It's the, oh no, the $2 million part, right? But he, he took his mom's Prop 13 basis, $2,000 a year in property tax. Right. And he rents it out for about 7K a month. Right. Right. <laughs> so right. he's like, I can't move into that house. Why would I do that? Exactly. <laughs> he's, like, he's like, I'm making 70 grand a year net profit on this house. Why would yes. I ever do that? So whether you're doing Airbnb or whether you're, you know, in this market, running it out to CEOs and dot com people, I had a client who came in from um, from Seattle. He was a senior executive at a defense contractor. Um, and when he came to the Bay Area, it was like his salary and everything was reported in Forbes. It was a big deal. Um, but he came here to the Bay Area and his company rented him a house in Portola Valley, 9000 a month. And they paid for all of it. And then yeah. um, he was there about two years and then he um, bought his own house with the vineyard and um, it's probably worth 10 now, but it's an example. I mean, you can rent them out in this area. Uh, 5,000 would be dirt cheap for a big home. And in some of those areas, seven to 12 grand a month is not unheard of. Well, in a $5 million property, the 1% is a savings of $50,000 a year versus the competition. So you, you, it's huge. It's you inherit a property, it, it becomes everything. And again, if, you, if, if people inherit these properties, or a lady, I just interviewed a lady who this is her business, she was in this position, she got divorced, you know, so her income went down and she was, having, she was getting older and struggling. Right. But she realized, you know, I, I, I pay this little basis for the property taxes. Yep. Uh, and, and then also, if she sold it, she'd have a huge tax bill. But by converting it to a rental property, th uh, I think two years later, you can then convert it to a non-occupied property, uh, sell it, and then defer the 1031. Using 1031, you can defer the gains to an income-producing property and buy a, a private building to give you income after that. Right. And so tremendous uh, pressure. If you want to see why Airbnbs are becoming more popular in various formations, it's because these yeah. tax you know, just tax that's one, of the, that's one of the more amazing parts of the tax code that people don't know about. But Bill, I'll tell you the number one reason people don't do it is because they don't plan that far out ahead. Really, the number one reason I got my real estate license is because I was sick and tired of my clients coming to me after they're in contract and then wow. I've never heard the word capital gains before. Wow. Right? They're but, they're literally in astro and then had a very unpleasant conversation with their CPA. And they realize what they're on the hook for. Realtor never bought it up. Nobody bought it up in the sales process. Well, wow. and then they're closing escrow next week. Their CPA is helping them fill out the paperwork, and then they they see that they're paying six or seven figures on their tax, and then they call me. Can I do anything? I'm like, no. You're already in. You already have a binding commitment to sell. So I tell yeah. all my clients now that you can do that, but it takes at least two years right. to plan that out because that's what you have to do is you have to qualify for both parts of the Internal Revenue Code separately, right? So it has to be your residence two of the last five years, and it has to be a rental property two of the last five years. So in a five-year swing, residence two years, rental property two years, then you can get your 500,000 out for a married couple and 1031 the balance into another property or several properties and do that. But it takes a crazy amount of foresight and people shockingly don't put that much planning into their sailing of their multi-million dollar houses. Anybody who's interested in these topics, there was an interview by Ben Shapiro of Robert Kiyosaki. Robert Kiyosaki is the author of Rich Dad, Poor Dad. May or may not like his politics or the personality, all that, but they do talk about real estate. It was a fascinating conversation. When Robert Kiyosaki talked about uh, personal residence in 1031, it was like watching a child talk about Christmas. He just said, it's just a gift in the tax code. Uh, and I think all of us have to take advantage of these opportunities for ourselves and, and I think educate our clients you have to be careful. I'm not an attorney. I'm not an accountant, but I can certainly bring in good professionals to give that advice to my clients, help them be successful. And that's my job as, as a real estate broker is to bring them. Yeah. Um, you mentioned that you used all the leads and how few there were. And so the question I think here doesn't really apply to you, um, but in general, uh, have you do you do marketing? Do you buy leads? Do you do any kind of mailers or phone calls or anything like that for business development or is your business not currently? Also? The, the one kind of unique criteria that's different for me than any, any other person for all the leads. And this is something that I kind of felt queasy about. So I kind of paused it. Mm -hmm. There's a rule in the state bar of California. I mean, realtors can't contact somebody who has another realtor, right? When you have a, when you have a listing agreement, right? right. So you can't hit up their client and try to get them right. for yourself. Attorneys right. have the same rule. I'm not right. allowed to speak to another attorney's clients. 
right. without the client, without the attorney being present. Right? right. So if I'm calling up people in probate, even wearing my hat as a realtor, Keller Williams, realtor, right. To help you with probate and you have an right. attorney. If right. I talk to the attorney first, it's going to be fine. But if I go through all the leads and I'm going straight to the person without reaching out to their attorney first, every now and then you'll get an attorney who's just wants to be a kind of a jerk about it. Right. And they can make your life very difficult. You know, like you're a licensed member of the bar, you contacted an attorney. Yeah. You know, even though I Probably. identify myself as a Keller Williams agent, not as an attorney, and I'm right. not trying to get their probate business. I'm not trying to take their probate client. Right. But that's the one thing that I have to walk a very fine line with the ethics rules. Right. Um, because my boss is the state bar. They don't like me. I'm done. Right. right. They don't like something I've done. They pull my license. So that was a question I asked by iPhone, but I will for the rest of you listening as far as data. On my YouTube channel, I have a bunch of videos, how to get started in probate, 11 ways to get listings, 11 ways to make sales. I'll put in the chat box on my website, I actually have a list of all the data companies I'm aware of nationally and a little bit of information I have on them, a coupon code on one, I've reviewed a couple of the video. And if you try another or use another data company and want to give me a, re a review for them, I'd love to add that to my list. Feel free to jump in the chat box and get that as well. Um, so let's talk a little bit though about business. You know, I have a a colleague here in Southern California who is an attorney and a realtor, and I think his business is probably 50-50, and even his, real, even his attorney work is probably more real estate. Uh, he does probate administration and then does real estate, uh, but it seems to me that one of the ways he gets business is attorneys like having him as the realtor because he obviously knows the laws, right. conducts himself in a lowly fashion and such. Do you do business? Do you get real estate business from other attorneys, or is your business more? Yeah, I mean, attorney? ultimately, that's the that, for me, that's the best way of getting that type of business as referrals is from other attorneys who know what I do. Right. Because it's, again, if if I'm contacting the client directly through like through a lead company, that does get weird. But I have right. so many relationships with other attorneys, right. and they know what I do. That's where that's where I get my leads from there, and just my own clientele. Right. I've been in business twenty years, so my own clientele and they refer me to their friends and family and they know what we do. So that's ultimately how I grow it is organically. Well, pre COVID, you know, I was going to court every day and I would see attorneys and they would not just see me, but they would see how I acted and how I, how I conduct myself to the judge and attorneys would sometimes say, well, that's the kind of realtor I want to work with. If you're an attorney, they right. see you kind of twice, you double dipping as far as the, your exposure, but obviously you also know how to act in a lawyerly way, in a way that's appropriate for the state. So it's a big advantage. I tell people who aren't real, who aren't attorneys as a realtor, when you go to court, dress like an attorney. Uh, that's the biggest mistake I see. Wear a dark suit, white shirt, and silk tie if you're a man, and a, equal, equivalent if you're a woman. Unless dress you're going like, to Santa Cruz County. <laughs> Okay, well, maybe, but I, in LA County for sure, and I would imagine in the bigger, uh, more formal counties, Alameda, I would think, just off the top yeah, of my head, so. Santa Clara, you want to dress in a lowerly fashion, and right. at least you'll be taken more seriously. Um, uh, you know, if, if you don't need more business, you can dress in what you want. But if you want to get business from people who wear suits and ties, you should dress in a suit and tie. That's just, I think, standard That's practice. True. That is absolutely true. Um, okay, so here's a question that I think I know the answer to, but um, just, you know, again, uh, Shay, thank you for being on the call and asking the question. And I, there is no bad questions. I'd love you guys to participate. I want to make this um, as participative as we can be. How does taxation work if the deed transfer is a gift of love and affection and is in probate? So um, a gift, whether it's a love and affection or hatred and frustration, a gift is a gift. Legally true? Yeah, so the the... The gift stuff is the number one re the number one reason people didn't do a whole bunch of end run stuff in uh, when they passed Prop 19, the cap, you know, the stepped up um, property tax thing is um, people don't understand that, especially in California, the tax code, the various sections of it, you have to analyze all of it for a client, right? So the number one thing people don't know about about gift tax uh, and gift deeds. And just gifting in general is that when you give it to somebody for less than fair market value, the person receiving the gift takes the cost basis of the donor. So if somebody bought a house in 1962 for 50 grand and it's worth 3 million, and then they're like, well, I, I just want to give it to my son now. He's already living there and we'd like to go to a retirement home. I'm just going to give it to him. The son would take the parent's house and they would have a $50,000 cost basis. 
on the house. So if they if the son sold it the next day, he's going to pay, you know, six seven figures in tax. So that's something that people don't know about um, is that it 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 ha it has no help for you at all in capital gains. So really, people are trying to get out of the property tax problem, and then they're jumping from the frying pan into the fire, right? So if I if I get around the property tax thing by gifting my son the property, now he has my capital gains basis. And you've exchanged a, a $50,000 a year deal with a six figure or seven figure tax bill. That's not a help net wise for the family. I see all the time people who try to create a logical way around the rules. And it may make sense when you're sitting in your own home at night, you know, with a baseball game in the background or whatever's distracting you. Hey, we'll, we'll just try this. Uh, can end up costing you a incredible amount of money. And that's why yeah. these things, and I am guilty in a sense, my whole career, I've never really had a proper accountant until about two years ago. I started making a lot of money. And, um, you know, I, I pride myself on being smart, knowing the rules and keeping things simple. But when I sat down with a real accountant and saw how much money I had given away, <laughs> I was pissed. They're worth their, they're worth their weight in gold, absolutely. Can be good one. A good one is, you know, the bad ones aren't worth anything, but the good ones are a lot. So, yeah. the um, thing that's the thing that's crazy is people forget that there's a you're playing a you're playing a football or a baseball game with an opponent. Your opponent's the Internal Revenue Service, <laughs> exactly, and they and they get paid very well to do their job, <laughs> and they weren't, you know, they're not new to this, right? And they're also the only opponent that will play a whole game with you, and then change the score after the game is over and you lost. And they that play forever. People, that play the, the dumbest thing I see, and I saw a ton of this during the real estate boom, is that they're like, oh, you can do this because the IRS has said you can. I'm like, you have no idea how they operate, dude. <laughs> like, they can wait you out. Why do, why do they need to rush in and say you can't do that? All they're doing is building up penalties and interest. Right. And then you're jumping from civil liability to criminal liability. Right. They don't care. Right. right? There's no statute of limitations if you defraud them or you fail a file. So people get real weird and they're like, oh, well, the IRS says, you know, there's some, you know, letter or somebody cites a, a private letter ruling. I'm like, where they all say you can't cite that for somebody else's issue. People get dumb and they forget the IRS is your opponent and they will change the rules of the game after you've played it and you will be in, in hot water. So I never do bleeding edge tax planning ever, you know, and the, and to borrow the metaphor of the golf, hit it down the middle of the fairway, right? Uh, maybe to the right, maybe to the left, but don't get off in the weeds. You're going to get yourself strung out. Yeah, it's like in golf. If you can cut the corner and make it, well, if you could, you'd be in the PGA Tour. <laughs> the rest of us are just lucky right. not to lose our golf balls as we're playing our golf. Exactly. Uh, Chris asked a question. Properties owned by a trust, owners pass, properties underwater, blighted, burned up, a neighborhood nuisance. Beneficiary successor trustee refused to sell the property. They probably can if it's underwater. They, they don't want to take the loss on it. Can the impacted neighbor petition the court to remove or place the successor trustee in order to abate the nuisance and sell the property? I don't know if they can remove the successor trustee, no. but, this, but the a different cities... No, a neighbor has no standing in anybody's probate or trust. They can get the county involved, and the county can declare it. Exactly. As I was say, they can notify the county. The county will, if it's blighted, uh, yeah. in some the cities, will, really the county will have to deal with that, the government. That's not, that's not private party to private party. Right. right. If it's a nuisance property and it's damaging your property, you could sue them or sue the estate or whatever, but you have no standing to replace a trustee. You can't force that hand. And the county loves doing it. They have plenty of staff because that's a revenue producing activity for them. They charge fees, they charge interest, and then when the property's sold, they get more tax. So to them, it's kind of like that's their business model. Exactly. Is, let, them do, let them do their part. That has nothing to do with my parties. And if you want to avoid them by selling it from out under, then they're fine with that. They're, they're going to get paid on their liens. They're going to get paid on their interest, taxes, fees. Right. And, and now there's a new buyer at a higher tax rate. So the answer there, Christopher, is definitely have the neighbors contact the county um, uh, for, or, or really cities for nuisances and abatements. Right. And eventually the county, at least in LA, the county will step in and force the sale. And then again, somebody can step in and, and buy it and pay all that off, but they have to solve all those problems. Um, okay, uh, Eagle asks, what's the cost of a living trust with a pour of a will for husband and wife with a single family residence? So this is a good question. 
Um, because the challenge is, you know, I talk a lot about, advise my clients and on this show and other things, yeah. that we should be encouraging our clients to find appropriate planning resources, which often includes a living trust. Um, and people are concerned about the cost. And um, I do recommend for basic ones, there's living, there's trustinworld.com, which is kind of like the legal zoom of the trust business. And I think it's about $1,700 bucks for a basic one. Now, I, I don't know how you feel this, but to me, as a businessman, not as an attorney, but as a businessman, I would say from 90% of the people, it's better than nothing, but it's not better than a Maybe. proper estate plan. Well, again, there, there's exemptions, there's exceptions, but we can argue about the percentage. But there's a percentage, I think more than half, that you're better off with that than nothing. Um, but there are plenty that's a problem of its own, for yeah. sure. And if you have, you know, certainly if you have, um, you know, split families or blended families and a business and multiple properties and complicated finances, 100%, uh, you need to get uh, a more sophisticated, appropriate. So how do, you, how do you answer the question, what's the cost of moving forward if it yeah. seems to be fairly simple, straightforward? Yeah, I mean, every, every law firm is different, however you want to handle it. And in fact, when I give my estate planning seminars, I actually give people the breakdowns, right? So you can go to a trust mill, right, run by paralegals, the fancy one, Legal Zoom, where they put in the disclaimer, we are not real attorneys. Consult with a real attorney. Um, and then you have attorneys who, I mean, you have attorney run trust mills. There's one in my town um, where you like watch some videos. And then I think mostly you deal with his mom or wife or whatever. Right. You may get about five minutes of his time and everybody gets the same convoluted nonsense. Right. Um, and then you have attorneys who do it for a living like us who are, who are either certified specialists or attorneys who basically that's their bread and butter and that's all they do. And they stand behind their work. The number one thing I tell anybody about a state plan is the real cost of an estate plan is not what you pay up front, it's what you pay on the back end, right? right? I know a lot of people that paid 500 bucks up front or did it for free and it cost them 50, 60, 100,000 on the back end. Right. Um, so really the true cost is not of an estate plan, it's not up front, right? So you can get a, you can get a $5 trust, you get a $5,000 trust, you won't know how much it's going to cost you until somebody's died and that money goes to the next generation to find out it wasn't funded. They didn't do proper tax planning. Um, one of the biggest probate uh, litigation cases we had was about, I think it's 2004, 2005. Um, we had a case that came to us. It was insane. This guy, the decedent, owned um, 28 properties, all of them in San Francisco on a schedule of assets. And during his lifetime, his CPA or whoever did his taxes said, hey, don't spend a lot of money on an attorney. Just go over to a trust mill and hammer it out. So he did that. <laughs> and he's on his second wife. He the first marriage, second wife. It's getting worse. It's like every red flag that we know to wave. Yeah. And this guy blew past all of them. And so in his trust mill document, at least it said what he wanted. It said 24 properties to my kids and sister and four to my uh, second wife. He dies. And the second wife goes to a big law firm and pulls out all 20 deeds. All 20 deeds say husband and wife joint tenancy, right of survivorship. I'm yeah. like, well, you had a trust, but it was empty. And everything went to them, to the wife, and the kids got zero. I mean, he just inherited his kids at 24 properties. And so how much did he pay for his estate plan? Well, on the back end, he had about a decade of litigation. Um, well, Plus the family squabbling and, and the energy and emotion yeah. that they go they through. They hated each other so bad. I, I don't even have the ver I don't even have the proper words to explain to you how right. much they wound up hating each other by the end of the process. Because like my business partner Leon always says, greed takes all. He's like, there was absolutely nothing at all stopping the wife, who knew completely right. knew what was the right thing to do. She right. Knew. Right. She People. she saw his document. She talked to him about it. The whole family had discussions on the estate plan. Everybody knew it was coming. And she looked at these deeds and said, I can give them whatever I feel like whenever I feel like it. And now you're off to a decade of litigation. So right. there was literally nothing stopping her from doing the right thing. And instead, she chose to keep it for herself. And that's what we call the Full Employment Act for Lawyers. Right? <laughs> and I think that you really highlight the opportunity for anybody in this call who's a real estate agent like me, that you don't have to necessarily do the documents. You don't have to um, really know the insights. Two things you can do, though, is find great resources in your market that you work with, that, that attorneys that will work with you or services that will work with you and bring value to your customers. And then second, I feel like as realtors, we're a little more aggressive on following up with our customers 
um, just like John said, you know, you get a living trust set up, it's like buying a safe and bringing it home, and you can stack all your valuables and collectibles on top of the safe, you're going to get robbed. You have to put it in the safe. Yeah, exactly. The properties have to be deeded in. And as real estate agents, we can verify that. We can go into public records. We usually have either in the MLS and or a title company will, will let us pull up for our clients a copy of the deed to verify it's in the trust, it's been recorded. As a courtesy, Mr. Jones, here's a copy of it so you can rest assured that your 20 Absolutely. properties are in the trust so that your desire in the trust is being effectuated because you put the property in the trust. And that's what we as realtors, when I, when I talk, call uh, yep. an estate planning attorney after there's a service, I'll do it for free. I'm glad to do it. I'm yep. set up to do it. I don't do it. I have a virtual thing. assistant who pulls them. Yeah. So I'll tell you about 90 to 95% of my client can't even locate their grant deed on their house. Exactly. I have, tell, I have to tell them how to dig it up. And then I just wind up getting it from a title company and sending it over to them. Right. Because um, most of them have long forgotten about it and they don't even know what it says. I had a lady, we talk about the title companies when you refi it, you take it out and they put it back in wrong. Well, at least they put it back in. I had, a, I had a lady I talked to who did a trust in 1999, put her house in her trust, refinanced it in 2000, took it out, never put it back in. And I talked to her in like 2019. And I was like, man, this is like a $3 million house. I was like, man, did you know your house has been out of your trust for 20 years? Right. You could hear her jaw drop through the phone. <laughs> well, and then sometimes people find out there is a process in California we call a Hegstead petition right. where with an attorney, after paying the fees, you can put the property back in the trust like it should have been. However, I can tell you in LA County, yeah. it's a court process. So you're going to pay an attorney, maybe not the full amount for probate, but you're going to pay a lot of money. And in LA County, at one time, it was six months from the filing before the hearing right. date. So it was longer than a probate would take to get the authority, get the property. Yeah, Hegstad so, Hex, so, is one of the unique California things, though. Yes. That's, what, that's where people have property in other states that's not available elsewhere. Correct. That's a California State Supreme Court deal. And in yeah. my career in the last 20 years, it actually has gotten better. They're getting a little bit more lenient. In the beginning, you had to like have it so ironclad that this was the absolute intention of the person and right. nothing to the contrary. They're they've loosened up a tad in that and they've made it, they've you know, come in with some other ways of proving that you meant to have it in your trust. Um, but I've done hexteds before. They're the ace of the hole. But I say when it comes to funding your trust with your house. There's three levels. Level one, what you want to do is deed it in and make sure it stays in because then you don't have to worry about a thing. Step two, level two of protection is what we're talking about, the Hegstead, which for those who don't know what Hegstead is, it just means if the schedule of assets of the living trust has a clear record of the real estate, then the court will confirm those assets even if the deed says something else. So but, if it got that's through a whole court case. Put that's back in. That's why the whole schedule of assets has to be complete and it has to have the house and it has to be more or less unambiguous that that's what the person wanted. And has to go to the judge. <laughs> I mean, it, you, you can't just follow form the county and get a change. Exactly. It's a, and it's the, a legal the, process. The, re, the giant problem with that is what will destroy a Hegstead is joint tenancy. Right. Because people have no idea. Joint tenancy is like the literal bane of my existence as a practitioner because it's so powerful and absolutely nobody knows how it works and mm -hmm. what it means for their family from a tax perspective. That family who, who emptied their trust and disinherited their kids, that guy had zero idea what he was doing. Just none. Uh, he never would have let that happen. That was the opposite of what he wanted, right? Giving 20 properties to second wife. Um, that was a train wreck for the whole family and joint tenancy pulls it out of probate. An asset in joint tenancy is not subject to probate. So if you had it taken out of your trust and it says joint tenancy with another person, probate has nothing to do with it. It's gone from your family forever. And that's something that people literally have no idea because I see it everywhere. And every time I talk to a client about joint tenancy, I'm like, is that what you meant? No, it's just, it's on the deed. I'm like, well, you got a real problem now. So let's help sweep that up. So Hegstead is just a means of confirming something to your trust. If it appears on the schedule of assets, and you don't have contrary intentions of the settler, the person creating it. Joint right. tenancy is, a, is something that would defeat it. Um, but if you don't have that, and it does appear on the schedule of assets, as you said, Bill, you go to court, you file an exit petition. It's not a full probate, but people can challenge it. Right. I did it. I did my my first exit. I did way back in two thousand five. Wow. Um, a gentleman. Um, I went to his house and I drafted a trust the same day I was in his house. His brother called me. We drove up there and did a trust for him. He had he got out of the hospital the day before. He had had five strokes in the last year of his life. Five. 
And that last one, he's like, I better have an estate plan. And he had five real properties. <laughs> he had five real properties, including his house and four rentals. And I put together a living trust for him at his house. I was there from like morning to night. And we put everything on the schedule of assets. And he was gone before anything got recorded. And so went to the courthouse, filed that Hegstead, said exactly what this guy meant and why it didn't get done while he was alive due to health concerns and, um, and things like that. And they approved it and the trust governed it from there. It was a trust administration, not a probate from that point on. So that's your first line of defense um, if you don't get a deed during your life, but it's not something you ever want to rely on because it can go wrong. And then the last, the last line of defense, if it's not in your trust when you die, and it's not on the schedule of assets, then you take the pour over a will and you probate that, you put the asset through probate and then pour it over your trust if you still have it. And that's something that's, um, I mean, it's there. It's at least it's not going to completely weird beneficiaries can test it. Um, but it's a, it's a total failure of your trust because you're going through probate to get it. So Chris, we asked a question. I think a couple of us are kind of left on pins and needles at the end of the story. How did the litigation end with the 24 properties? Did the, kid end, the kids end up getting any of them or the uh, wife ended up with all of it? I don't even have the time to tell you the whole story. It should really go to the law book. We, saw, <laughs> we, we swapped out of that case about two years into it. And so what happened, the, the insane thing is, right? In law school, they always tell you never expect a very mason moment, right? Don't expect the defendant to confess on the stand or whatnot or the smoking gun, they don't exist in real life. In our, in our case, the thing that was amazing um, is that this family, the blended family, did this thing. I mean, we're, I'm showing my age here. You remember passing the camcorder at birthday parties kind of thing? Yes, exactly. Right? They did yeah. something like that. And I don't know how, Leon told me about it. I'm like, that's the, that's the strange thing I've ever heard in my career. And he's like, I know, I couldn't believe it either. They actually passed a camcorder or something like that and recorded everybody talking about their estate plan. And wow. they had the wife admitting that she knew what he wanted to do with the property. Wow. This is like a and movie. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And we're like, uh, <laughs> so we, broke like a movie a would... we broke her to settlement. But what I told you about the personal, the personal uh, animosity, I'm putting yeah. it very mildly. These people, so, had they thought about it, probably would have put out hits on each other. It was that bad. I mean, it was, movie, it was nasty. Ever, ever seen the movie so, Body Heat? We broke it a settlement and then um, it, it came down the wire and they, everybody refused to sign it because they still wanted blood and they, they wanted to go out and we're like, all right, we're done. So we swapped in a litigation firm. They went after us. They went another six years back and forth, duking it out for another six years. They weren't done hitting each other in court. You know, we got them justice too fast and they, they wanted vengeance. And we're like, we're in the justice business, not the vengeance business, right? I'm an attorney. I'm not Batman. So... <laughs> <laughs> go elsewhere for your vengeance business. I'm sure some of you have to take your money on a contingency and see if they get paid on the back end. So yeah, that, that, that case was an absolute trip. Um, Leon actually subbed out and it was just like, whatever, man. And then forgot about it. And then was leaving the, one of the courthouses like six, seven years later, ran into the attorney we subbed it to. And he's like, whatever happened? He's like, they're still going. And he's like, how is that even, we got you the, we got you the Hail Mary, dude. Like, how on earth could you still be in litigation at this point? I mean, even a year after we subbed it out to you, it should have been done. Like, how is this still in its fifth or sixth year after we got out? And you're now looking at seven, eight years. But they weren't, they weren't done punching each other, and so we had to sub out. Wow. Well, I think there's a movie script when you're done with your law and real estate career. I think there's a movie script there, like Body Heat. If, if, you, wrote a, if you wrote a book on it, the editor would throw it back at you. You'd be like, that's not realistic. Yeah, yeah, I think you're right. That's not believable. Right. People don't act that way. I'm like, no. They do. We hear we hear some insane stories and I haven't begun to tell you, you know, even a fraction of them. That isn't even top five for us. That's <laughs> I mean, maybe top six. <laughs> Well, John, we're going to come back to you about three to six months. We'll have you again, and we'll, the, the, the title of the interview will be my top five stories. We'll just start with that, and we'll forget yeah. all the information about probate because it's entertaining. And I think this speaks to why I do these calls is, you know, I mean, I, I'm in business. I have to make money. But at the end of the day, you know, I like to learn. I enjoy the process, and I want to make it interesting for other people too. And I hope if you're watching, whether you're on the live stream or you're watching on a replay, that this is it is meant to be entertaining, enjoyable, and also educational to help us be better at our jobs. Um, look, I know you're a busy guy, John. Thank you so much. Thank you, Bob. Um, I put in the chat box your contact information, your website, 
Uh, John Eric Fraker.com is the website and on Facebook. Actually, let me, let me give you my law firm one real fast. Okay, sure. Um, let me grab my keyboard. Yeah, see if I can type it in the, type in the chat. Just for my law firm, so you can see my law firm website. Sure. Oops, and my keyboard not working now. I'll send that to you, Bill, and you can send it to other to everyone else. What is it? What's the website? Uh, it's just anerfraker.com. Here we go. A I N E R. Yeah, that's my law firm website. So you can okay. see and contact us that way. That's just my law firm website. John Eric Fraker is my KW Keller Williams website. And you practice law in California? Do you do you California handle? Only. Okay, and do you handle just Northern California, just certain counties, or all California? I do the whole state. It depends on the services needed. Like I'll do a living trust anywhere in California because that's easy. Great. Um, and it's not really, you know, I don't have to be. I can do almost everything virtually with folk. Um, I don't do litigation where you have to show up in court in Southern California because I'm not there. Great. LA County, my business partner did a case. Excuse me, ex parte in Los Angeles. It was of all things. Um, adverse possession, which is so strange. They teach you in law school and you have to know it. And then you run into it maybe once in a career because um, the criteria is really obscure. Uh, and so Leon had one. Um, this is like t- about 15 years ago in Los Angeles County. His parents live out in Hammett. But the crazy part is that for ex parte, most courts don't require you to physically be present to do ex parte. And back then, LA did. And they also didn't give you notice until five o'clock the day before your hearing. So wow. you had to do an ex parte, you had to jump on an airplane at five o'clock at night Wow! at the end of the day to fly down to LAX, rent wow. a car and um, be in the, be in the court in the morning. And that was uh, unpleasant because client didn't, clients, clients aren't going to pay you enough to make that worth your time. I mean, yeah. you basically wind up taking a day or two off work to do that. So things like that litigation, um, I sub that out to people local of the county. And also, I mean, you're in LA, I'm in the Bay Area. These are the major counties of California. When you start getting further out um, into smaller counties, closer to Oregon, et cetera, you're not, you're not going to be able to represent people because they have a, oh, what's the word? Uh, home cooking. You don't have an attorney <laughs> from their county. You're, you're DOA. My Hopefully. father-in-law is an attorney. Uh, he's retired now. But he's from San Francisco, a big law firm in San Francisco. Get a case out by Shasta, way out there. Uh, where they don't even see themselves as Californians. And um, he presented his whole thing to the judge. And the judge was like, well, you made a very good case. Um, but see those people over there on the bench? And he's like, yeah. He's like, those are our local bar. He's like, I'm going to decline your matter until you hire one of them to present your case. <laughs> and he's like, uh, okay. And so he wrote him a check. He hired someone like on the spot, hired him, and the judge approved the case. <laughs> but he wouldn't do it for a big San Francisco law firm. Wow. Wow. So in, cook- in a lot of those areas, you're getting, you know, some of the smaller counties, you get into some um, home cooking and bias issues. So retaining a local counsel is in your client's best interest. Very good. Well, look, John, uh, adafraker.com is a website. We'll have that in the chat notes. Um, it handles uh, state planning throughout California, probate administration, most of the state, uh, or, or help you find somebody if you need to. Of course, if you need somebody in Los Angeles for uh, litigation. I'm glad to make a, a introduction if necessary. We really appreciate having you on, John. It's been great. Always fun chatting cool. with you. Appreciate seeing you on Chad's program, probatemastery.com. Yep. We do that on Tuesdays. Yep. This is Probate Weekly. We do it every Thursday, 4 p.m. Pacific, 7 p.m. Uh, Eastern Time. We have a Facebook group, Probate Experts. You're welcome to join in there for free. Uh, these calls are, are done live. I would love to have you participate, ask questions. It's meant to be informative. But if you're watching on the restream or, or replay, feel free to ask questions there and let us know that you're watching and let us know how we can help you with your probate business. So thank you so much, everybody. Have a fantastic week. Appreciate you. Bye-bye. Thank you, Bill. And let's go.